tonight we're talking about something that uh, is one of our core concepts, and that's kind of the theme of Q4. So uh, for those of you who haven't been on the call before, every quarter we plan out the training content for the entire quarter. And there's uh, always a, a theme of it. This quarter is us teaching through our core concepts. So if you're uh, new to all true partners, you'll understand what it is that we uh, our model and our consulting approach, the all the all true approach, what it's built on. Uh, so good time to be here. So what's one challenge that you're dealing with this week, or uh, one goal that you're you're pursuing this week? And the Asha, I saw your comment in the chat, uh, shifting for one on ones. Explain that. What does what does that mean? Um, that was more because um, I had implemented one-on-one forms a little bit differently and I was actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting for my one-on-ones on a, a bi-weekly basis. And then I was told that is not my responsibility to be doing all the extra heavy lifting. Um, so that actually alleviated a lot of that pressure because having that meeting with Kirk earlier today, um, he provided the proper way to one be holding the one-on-one form or the one-on-ones and the right questions to be directed in the conversation to make sure it stays aligned with what they should be about. And then also the new forms of putting it back on the responsibility of my team. So I'm not having to go in and do all the work and transfer all the information for the last meeting. It's just putting it back on them. So I'm not having to keep, you know, taking on all extra work as a business owner. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. As a business owner, your job is to lead the team and empower the team to really function without you. One of the things that, you know, is a, a core principle for us at Ultra Partners is we want to, in working with clients, set our clients up so that they don't need us anymore. And the the great part about that is when you do that, and that's really just empowering the people that you're working with, you actually create a relationship where they'll keep coming back to you because you always go back to the source of that empowerment, the source of that support that you have. So awesome. Glad to hear that. And forgive me, I, I don't want to skip over. Um, everyone drop in the chat, hey, Bob, because Bob is uh, our newest client uh, that just got signed up with us last week. And uh, we're in the, he's in the midst of getting prepared. He's over in on the East Coast and getting prepared for the storms. Uh, his company does uh, a lot of work in asphalt and they're preparing for the storms to support people as they're coming out. And this is one of the things I love uh, when I was talking to Bob initially about why he wanted to become a client and why he wants to grow his business. One of the things he said that I thought was amazing was he wants to impact the environment, taking care of animals and also helping at risk youth. Uh, and that's, that's awesome. So Bob, uh, we haven't kicked off done his kickoff call yet because he's been busy the past week with his team getting prepared to help people when these when uh, Hurricane Milton comes. And it's it's a big one, so be praying for those folks out there. And hopefully it's not as devastating as uh, they're expecting. Uh, but this is why we, we get in business, to help people, to create transformation. And if you're in a business that uh, has that kind of uh, support and you can help people in that way, it's a great opportunity to show up. And a lot of people will think, oh, there's a great opportunity to make money. But our philosophy at All True Partners, help people, get rich through helping people, and then give generously from that wealth. And that's what Bob's doing. So Bob, welcome to the, the all true team. So via the link that's in the chat, you click, it'll open it up in a PDF format for you. And we're going to be talking through the number one business model model for scalable growth. And this is something that the all true team in the past, really the past a uh, little over 10 years, we've all been consulting businesses. And especially in the last three years, we've worked with literally thousands of businesses, all different industries, different sizes from startups to nine figures. And as we've looked at businesses, there have been commonalities that we've seen. And this is where when we're coaching, when we're training, we look at not just industry specific, but we look at what are the business principles that work across industries so we can support lots of different businesses. So one of the things we've seen is that there are really only three business models, and we're going to walk through those and explain what they are. If you've been a client with us for a while, you've heard this, uh, but it's good to get a refresher to look at your business and ask the question, how are you structuring it? Are you structuring it in this way so that it's maximum efficiency, and the more efficient your business is, the better you communicate, the better you, you utilize and share data, 
the quicker you're able to grow, the more effectively you're able to grow. And not only that, but you can grow and it can be sustainable because we've seen businesses snap back to a lower revenue uh, beyond the roller coaster of revenue where revenue goes up, revenue drops down, profitability goes up, profitability drops down. And for a lot of the businesses that we've worked with, when we initially step in, what we find is that they don't know why. They just know revenue is going up and down. But because they don't have the visibility on the data, they don't have the insight because of how their business is structured, teams are frustrated, people are frustrated, and they're really fishing in the dark, hoping that things will turn around. And that's where we see a lot of business owners who, uh, and there's nothing necessarily, this isn't a judgment on anyone. It's just the reality of business. You're good at what you sell, but unless you're an expert at growing businesses, which we are because we've worked with so many different businesses, you're an expert in your specific business. Growing that into more of an empire means understanding marketing and sales, finance and accounting, all the things that you didn't go to school for. And if you're like most entrepreneurs, you didn't go to school to learn to do the thing that you're now doing. You went into a trade or maybe you did go to school and now you it's completely irrelevant. I learned marketing by doing marketing, by starting an agency, by helping businesses. Uh, many of you, most of you are the same way. So that's where on these calls, we want to give that to you, give you that insight so you can learn those things. But here's what's important. You don't need to master finance and accounting and marketing and sales. You simply need to understand enough of them to, to be dangerous. You think of uh, the head coach on a football team. He understands the game at a high level. He understands a lot of the intricacies, but then he hires an offensive coach. He hires a uh, defensive coordinator because they are specialists in those areas. For small businesses that are under 20 million, you typically don't have the leadership structure you don't have the CFO, someone like Tim, who has 10 plus years in scaling businesses, mergers and acquisitions, structuring, uh, different structures, equity, all of that. You don't have someone like Kirk, who's been in strategic HR for over 10 years, building processes and supporting hiring hundreds of employees, uh, thousands over the course of his career. You don't have those people and you don't even know how to hire them. So on these calls is where you can get the insight to at least get you pointed in the right direction and get the resources so that you can start to move in the right direction. Because sometimes it's just a simple matter of knowing what to avoid, knowing the red flags, so you can head in the right direction. So like I said, these are this is coming from the thousands of businesses that we've worked with. These are the three models that we've seen. The first model, if you look in your worksheet, is the... Parallel lanes model. Now, when we say model, we're not talking about how you deliver your product or service. We're really talking about how the the business infrastructure is set up. How are and this really comes down to the flow of data and communication. I like to say with data, data is the crystal ball that you can look into, and data tells you where you've been, so you can predict where you go, where you're going. Helps you understand the past so you can predict, predict the future. With all two partners, we know where we'll be in, we can predict where we'll be in one year, three years, five years because of the data that we have. When we work with our clients, we look at that data and Tim on the financial side will build a model. On the marketing side, I can predict how campaigns will perform and how much we need to spend in order to get a certain number of leads so that we convert on the sales side. We can look at all of that data but when you, but most businesses, I'd say 95, 99% of businesses have, are structured in regards to the data communication in this parallel lanes model. This is where you have different departments or business functions that are operating all in separate lanes. Think of a highway and they're all driving parallel. And the one thing that's, that happens when you're driving parallel is you can't just cross over. You bump into each other, accidents happen, really are, are, transportation system probably needs a better model. But this is what happens when you have lanes running side by side. So you're, they're operating in separate lanes. And the big problem with that is typically there is minimal or there's simply limited communication happening between the business functions. Operations, it should be running point. The How is the business operating? This is your, you as a business owner, typically if you're under 10, 15 million, 
you're the person running operations. You might have a director of operations, but typically it's you. And when you're in this spot, you're trying to communicate to finance to figure out where are we going? What's happening? You're trying to communicate with sales. Are we, are we closing? What do we need? Why are we not converting? Marketing is just kind of deer in the headlights. And I like to poke fun at marketers, even though I am a marketer. I like to poke fun at marketers, as does Kirk, because marketing is that black hole in businesses where money goes to die. It just disappears. It's the it's the the left sock black hole of business where it just disappears because there's not communication. Breakdowns of communication in this model most often happen between marketing and sales. Marketing is blaming sales for not converting the leads, and sales is blaming marketing for there not being any leads or they're they're all bad leads. Uh, we see this all the time. Uh, AJ, who's our head of agency, our agency partner, he he sees this all the time. We work exclusively exclusively with him because we get great results for our clients. But the thing we run into is if there's a sales team that's not converting, everything falls apart. In the same way, if you have a killer sales team and they have no leads, everything falls apart. And then you have HR, the, the Kirks of the world, just crying in the corner because the entire company is frustrated. Now we're, we're having conflict, we're clashing, and then that creates bad culture. And then your culture directly impacts your revenue, your conversion, everything. This is the parallel lanes model. Now let's on these calls, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you to be transparent. How many of you right now would say your business in the way that you have your data and communication is structured is more in this parallel lanes model? And like I said, this is 99% of businesses. They're in this spot where they're structured in this way. Here's the key challenge with this model. It leads to poor alignment and missed opportunities for growth because the departments are not connected. If you're functioning on a team, everyone has to be talking. How many of you guys played sports? Just drop a yes in the chat. You played sports, you're on some kind of team. The whole idea of a team is that everyone's communicating. You're talking to each other, defense, offense, whatever it is. Basketball is a great example because you switch, the same people switch from offense to defense multiple times in the middle of the game, which means you have to communicate. Everyone knows their role. They know the rest of the team members' roles. They know how they function. They know where they should be. They know how to run the plays. Their communication has to happen. Ironically, that same level of communication doesn't happen so often in business. And Asha, Asha says... I feel like our lanes are, are no lanes. Asha, unpack that. You're dropping cryptic comments tonight. <laughs> There's more to that. I feel like um, our lanes are no lanes. What does that mean? So when I say no lanes, I'm talking about, I mean, we're, we're a growing company. We're a team of eight. And I feel like there's plenty of us that wear multiple hats. So like, operations and finance they kind of fall between myself and matt so it's like those are blended lanes and then like sales and marketing um like we know that we had to have them separately but because everyone is kind of like doing multiple things on our team right now it just it doesn't feel like everyone has designated space if that makes sense okay got you yeah so so this typically is the most painful. Well, we've I've seen it in two situations, and maybe Kirk and or, or Tim have additional insight. But I've seen this where businesses will push through, and if if they're able to grow, and typically I've only seen like maybe three to five million, depending on the industry. Construction can be a lot more, but they hit a real pain point because in order for this structure to work, you have to have someone that's running around like a chicken with their head cut off all over the business talking to everyone, all kinds of meetings, all kinds of emails. And that's where you end up with the culture where people are saying that meeting could have been an email. Well, not really, because you have one person trying to corral all these people. And typically that's you as a business owner. So this structure is, this is a weak structure because it it's not sustainable. It leads to burnout. It leads to frustration. Yeah. And Kirk said, uh, owners, you know, owners become the bottleneck. So we definitely don't want to be in that structure. There is a second structure 
that we've seen. Now we've seen this structure work for companies to go past a hundred million, well past a hundred million, and do it very fast. But similar to the parallel lanes model, the overlapping functions model is it's actually much more efficient because this model involves departments sharing responsibilities and it leads to a lot more collaboration. It's better organized. There's more synergy because everything is together. Everything's overlapping. It's not all running side by side. So data is flowing, communication is happen happening, but often because of the inefficiencies in this model, which I'll point out here in a second, it leads to confusion and it leads to a level of ineffic inefficiency. And we've seen firsthand when you start adding dozens, hundreds of people within this kind of structure, the communication, that's where it starts to break down, especially when you make the transition from adding lots of team members. And when you get to a certain point, uh, usually you're like 20 to 30 million in revenue, depending again on your industry. But when you start to get to the place where you have a lot of people to manage and you as a business owner, you need another level of leadership underneath you. So you go from top level leadership to, you know, that's your C-suite, your executives, and then you want middle management. This is where you get your directors. You start moving people into director roles or hiring those roles. Hiring is actually, it creates a worse situation, but let's, let's use the better situation. You promote people into director roles, then communication starts to break down because now you have an additional level of visibility of oversight. And typically if you have solid uh, people in those director seats, they start to notice where the breakdowns are happening because they're closer to it. They start to have those conversations. I love it. Kirk said, business fractured by friction. So here's where this model uh, does well. You get more collaboration because you have, in this case, typically marketing and sales are more connected. You've got stakeholders in, in those seats and they're talking. They're talking KPIs, strategy, there's communication happening there, at least to some degree. You've got HR. If you have a sales heavy organization, especially if you're growing, you need people to sell. So you're going to hire a, a team of salespeople. You're building your sales force. So HR gets involved. Marketing, you don't need as many people, but HR might get involved there as well. And then you have your uh, HR on finance. You need people to track the money, to manage the money, your accountants, your analysts. And in the middle of it, is operations running everything. You also have marketing talking to finance. Here's how much money we need to make. Here's how profitable we need to be. Here's how much you can spend. Don't spend any more. It's usually the latter. Finance is telling marketing, no, you can't spend any more money. No, you can't have any more. And this is where the breakdown starts to happen because even though there's more communication and more flow of data, there's still a breakdown and here, again, this is what we've seen firsthand. Um, my wife, was a; she's been a controller uh, at multiple companies. Uh, she's led accounting teams, built accounting teams in companies ranging from all the way from startups to, uh, to global multi-billion dollar companies. And she's seen the breakdown happen when sales is making deals, making offers, creating and marketing is creating promotions that never run through the finance and accounting team. So finance and accounting gets an invoice, they get a contract, and they have no idea what this offer is. Or you have sales lacking proper process. So they're quote unquote closing deals, but they're not getting proper signatures on the contract. So then clients are paying, then they stop paying and those deals are void because there's not proper signatures. So you start to see the breakdown of process because the more, and actually Kirk, I'll ask you to speak to this and give insight. And I'll just make this one comment. The more people you add in, to the mix in a company, the more opportunity you create for breakdown. 100%, the more humans you add to an element, the more opportunity there is for miscommunication. Think of the game um, telephone. You started at one end and it's one message, you get to the other end of the room, whether it's 10 people or 100 people, 1000 people, the message ends up being very different between the first person that took in the message, and the last person that's delivering the message at the end. Same thing, if we don't have clear lines of communication and we can go into this in another uh, call, um, but 
the organizational chart is not a luxury item. It's a communication tool. And so all that we're talking about today is really structural sound um, organizations. It lives and dies by your ability to communicate well, clear, and efficiently throughout the organization, maintaining that alignment from top to bottom, and then conversely, bottom to top. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a, I, I, I've, I'll have to share it um, maybe via email, but there, there's a, a hilarious video uh, of, of the telephone game, except they're not using words. They're using gestures. So the first person may do, they go ear, ear, and they go like this. And the next person is supposed to copy that and mimic it to the, the person in front of them. Well, once you get three, four people down, they're doing something completely different. And it becomes this hilarious thing. But it's it's very true because people have different personalities. People interpret things differently. Someone says the exact same thing, but with a different tone and it gets interpreted as a negative. So we've seen real breakdowns. So the key challenge with this is that one, you have to have clear boundaries because with overlap, people start to step into other lanes, other functions in an effort to fix the inefficiency. So not only do you get inefficiencies created, but people are now trying to take initiative, which is a good thing, but initiative without direction, without structure, without the proper lines of communication, without proper process, leads to people stepping out of their lane into someone else's, or in this case, out of their circle, into someone else's circle, creating a new process, creating a different process, and now you have, you have all this communication because of how someone interprets something. And we've seen this happen over and over again with great companies, great people. They grow too fast. They grow without implementing and fortifying their structure. Last week, we talked about the four stages of business growth. If you weren't here, go back to YouTube, watch that. The four stages of business growth, foundation, fortification, foresight, and then fortune. If you don't go through those four stages, you'll end up broken. And this is where we've seen companies, tens of millions, over 100 million, have massive layoffs, lose profit, because even though this structure is better, it still has its downsides and its inefficiencies. Does that make sense to everyone? How many of you would say uh, your business is kind of structured like this? Uh, Logan said, we're a smaller company and similar to Asha, we have multiple hats. How do you establish these communication channels? Okay, so how do you establish the communication channels and how do you structure the meetings so it doesn't feel like uh, we're micromanaging, questioning performance, or overstepping. I'll let I'll give that to Kirk because that gets into <clears throat> cafe chats and a lot of the HR stuff. Yeah, so that's a great question. I think it's um, when you you have people that wear multiple hats and it feels like you're leading every meeting. It really is important to go through the process of bringing somebody along to not necessarily lead meetings right out of the gate, but bring them along in the sense of making them a stakeholder of a section or sections of that meeting. So think of it, if you have a meeting with five topics and it's just a, a, a touch base at the end of the day, it's 15 minutes, you have five topics that you're going to punch out. I would say in large case, bring that person along in your next one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, this next um, end of week touch base that we're going to do with the team, I would like to have you share X. I want you to take stakeholdership of X topic, and I want you to take two to three minutes and just update the team on this. My goal in this is not to give you complete ownership of the meeting right out of the gate, but I want you to take stakeholdership of this section. And then I can com continue to delegate to where I'm literally at the end of probably three to four weeks, I'm able to shift their ownership of that meeting and then just be there as a support role. So it doesn't feel like Logan's doing all the meetings. You can now delegate and have a, lot, a high level of confidence that that employee, that team member is able to own that meeting start to finish. And you can be in a support role where the team doesn't see you as the one leading the meeting, but also they also see 
the the optimism of delegation of a future leader in development right in front of them. The most powerful thing that we can communicate is through our people, not just to our people. So if we can delegate those things incrementally to where we can transfer the stakeholdership of a meeting or a series of meetings to that person where we're not losing um, the authenticity of the meeting or the spirit behind the content of that meeting, but delegating it to where they understand, for lack of a better term, how the sausage is made, and then they can go and do that. The goal being that you're you're able to take one team, take a, a leader in development, and duplicate that whole team and drop them into more or less a, a copy and paste of that team to three of five techs uh, into the next generation of your business. So, absolutely, love it. So, if you're if this is how you're structured, you have an advantage. But how many of you like to see the very simple structure that from studying billion dollar brands, companies that have really scaled, run really efficiently, have great culture that we've we've created from what we've seen. So this is the the business structure model that we operate by. This is how all true partners are structured. This is how we coach and lead our clients and guide our clients to structure their business. The integrated data and communication model, very simple structure. When you look at all of these structures, because there's there's logic to it, how many of you have ever done a, a team builder leadership development training where uh, there's one where they'll give you spaghetti noodles and you have to build a structure? You, have, you get raw, raw pasta noodles and then you get marshmallows and you have to build a structure. Well, if you've ever done that, if you look at this structure with just lines, very weak structure, there's no actual support because there's no base, there's nothing holding everything together. If you look at the overlapping models, a circle is, it's a strong structure, but it's not stable. A pyramid is a very strong, stable structure. Lasts for thousands and thousands of years. It's got a strong base and everything is, the weight of every side is, the gravity is pulling it. I'm getting a little scientific now because I'm a nerd. The gravity is pulling it toward itself. So all of the weight comes down into the center and every component, it becomes a key part of the structure. No one component is taking all the force, it's shared. So when we look at businesses that succeed and that have been able to scale fast and scale sustainably, they're structured in this way. So some of the key components that we look at, number one, the foundation of every business is marketing and sales, finance and accounting. When, think about, I'm going to think about your business when you started. The very first thing you did was you thought about what you're going to sell. And the reason you started selling that was because you believed you could make money selling that, that people would buy it. You thought about the money. You thought about the finance. And then you tried, you had to figure out how do I count the money? Where do I put the money in a bank account or under your mattress, whatever you just chose to do? I'm not judging. But at some point, you started by thinking about how do I market and sell? How do I track my finances, grow my finances and account for the money that I'm making? That's where business starts. You have to have those things in place. We treat marketing and sales as one function. They're right hand, left hand. One can't function without the other. A bike needs two wheels. You can have a unicycle, but you'll look like a dork. A bike has two wheels, left hand, right hand. If you ride a unicycle, uh, I am judging you. Then finance and accounting, same thing, right hand, left hand. Finance looks forward. Where are we going? Uh, forecasting, projecting how we're going to grow. And then accounting looks backwards. Where have we been? And how do we leverage that data to inform where we're going? So the, one of the first things we do when we work with any business is we go in and we get all their financials. We get all up in their business, literally and figuratively. And we start looking at how they're structured. We start looking at the data. What are the trends? When Tim does the, does the presentation, when we deliver uh, what we call a business action plan, client spaces light up or they're, they're surprised or shocked when they start to see the numbers and the trend lines of their cash, of their, their CapEx, of their sustainability. And it starts to make sense when they see that full picture. And then at the leading the forefront is operations because ultimately you have to operate your business. Someone has to go out and keep things running. But you'll notice in the center, 
that the dark center is HR and people because the core of every business is you have to have people and you have to have good people. That's you as a business owner. That is your team members. That's every person you'll hire. There has to be communication flowing all throughout. So in this model, all the communication centers around the people, not the people in operations, not the people in finance and accounting, not the people in marketing and sales, but all of the people as a team. Marketing and sales, finance and accounting operations, those are functions that are executed by the people on the team. And you'll notice here, in both of these structures, there's barriers to data and communication. There's areas where there's no communication, sales and finance, no communication, marketing, HR, there's no connection. In this model, everything is connected. So the data, we build strategy we based on data, we execute that strategy, which gives us more data about our assumptions, how we're performing. That data rolls back down to inform marketing and sales, finance and accounting, and then we improve the strategy. So this just goes round and round. We've built this structure, so there's no breakdown. There's minimal opportunity. And now this is just the over the, the high level model of how we structure it. Within that, you have your processes. Uh, Kirk is designed based on all his based on his decades plus of um, strategic HR, a specific flow of how you have a one on one. So it's effective. Uh, him and Asha had that meeting today. On marketing and sales, based on my experience, I've designed specific processes and a way of structuring campaigns, tracking it so they're super effective. So this is the structure that the that the most successful companies in the world have. Because the bigger you can't grow to multiple billions of dollars, or you know, in the case of Apple or Amazon, in the trillions of dollars, if you don't have a flow of good communication, if you don't have a structure, businesses like that with ten thousand plus employees cannot function if there isn't a phenomenal flow of data and communication up, down, sideways, all throughout the organization. So. Major advantages of, of this structure, uh, you get seamless communication, shared data, which helps unify uh, the goals, unify decision-making, because everyone has access to the data. If they need it, they have access to it. And so what part of what Heather does, uh, Heather's our, our COO, what she's great at is she's great at making sure that companies have the right systems in place. So one of the things that she teaches at our, uh, our uh, Scaling on Purpose Summit uh, which we're having later this month, she teaches about that, that every company typically has two to three data hubs. You have the finance and accounting hub. If you're small, a small business, it might just be QuickBooks. And then you'll scale up to something like NetSuite. And she's done those implementations uh, and you get more sophisticated. On the marketing side, you have a CRM. And then as you grow, you might upgrade to HubSpot and then Salesforce and FusionSoft as you get more complex in the business. And then as you get, as you do scale up, you typically will add in an operations data hub that takes all of the information from the other two hubs and pulls them together and becomes your dashboard so that you as a business owner can see all of the key metrics to make decisions. And then you can rely on that to have checks and balances with your leadership team, make sure that the information they're giving you, decisions they're making are based on real data and you now are making really strategic decisions and you're not just guessing. This is where business becomes fun. It becomes real. It becomes like a chess game. I taught my kids recently to play risk. Uh, my son is 10 and my uh, second daughter is, my youngest daughter is 14 and they love it because it gets them to think long-term and they're looking at how many people they have and what are the odds of winning and it reveals a lot about how they think. But business becomes that when you have access to the data. So data-driven decisions, you have increased efficiency and faster growth. So regardless of your size, if you start like this and then you build processes within this, which is a whole other conversation, this is where you can grow with confidence and with the clarity to know where you're going and how you're going to get there. So what was that helpful? Was that Did that bring some clarity and some insight to help you guys as you're looking at your business? Some of you, it might, make, it might have made you question your business. Like, okay, I need to change some things if I really want to grow. And Kirk, I, I love Kirk's question. 
would your decisions get faster and more valuable if they were driven through data? And here's the thing in business. There, there's a level of intuition. When you're, when you're a smaller business, you're under five to 10 million, again, depending on industry, you don't necessarily have the data. If you were never tracking it, you don't have it. So often when we're working with clients, because we we typically, we specialize in work with businesses that are doing two to 20 million and helping them scale past that. But we typically start with them at that size because they have all of these problems. If it's your, if they're bigger than that, those problems are already, it's crumbling, it's falling apart. That's that's a whole different engagement. But if you're in that place where it's, you're in two to 20 million, you're, if you're looking at your structure, you don't have the historical data because you haven't tracked it. So we have to make assumptions, but even our assumptions are based on experience and experience is just another word for data. We know in marketing, finance, HR operations, we know the stats, we know the trends, we know the common things, we understand people. So those are the things that we start to coach our clients on as we make assumptions. Right now we have a client where we it was a business turnaround. They were, uh, they had some, invested in the wrong, some of the wrong things. It hurt the business. They were tight for cash. So we looked at the data and we made some really tough decisions and they were brave. And now the business is starting to turn around. And based on the little bit of data we have, we're now looking further and further ahead and making decisions. And as we get more data, we then make even more clear decisions. So regardless of where your business is at, you want to start looking at fixing this or uh, setting up this structure to your business. So that's it. I want to shut up now. I've talked long enough. I want your minds are probably racing with questions. So I want to open it up for any questions on those models. How do you implement it? This is your opportunity where you can pick our brains and uh, have us walk you through those things. All right, Bob. I'll call you. I called you Janice, but I know that you're you just no, no. I <laughs> I signed out on my uh, cell phone, and I I hate doing it. I was trying to figure out her computer because um, we uh, I didn't stay where I live. I went to a different house due to the storm, obviously. So I had to figure out a Zoom meeting really quick on somebody else's computer. So fun stuff. Um, but what I would say is, I, I I'm new to the meeting. I don't know where everybody's at and their size and. Um, and one thing I would say, and you mentioned, I believe you said your son found it to be fun now. Um, as you know, we we got to, we're at the entry level of your pyramid, and as the owner, now that we've got to that level, and I have a team making up that pyramid for all the owners on here, the level of stress goes down a hundred percent because now you have people doing every everything is not coming at you. Um, and since then, the, the belief lid has gone through the roof. So if there's one thing I could say for everybody is try to get to that pyramid and then your life will definitely change because it has for myself. And now we're going to take off with you guys and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So by the one earlier, if I was playing with the cell phone, I apologize. I wanted to say thank you to everybody in the chat and everything else uh, for welcoming aboard. Awesome. Bob, glad you're here. And if you guys know about Bob, Bob went from, Bob has, uh, what is it, tripled or quadrupled his business in the last couple of years. Um, right. And and one of the things I I, know, I love about you, Bob, is you, I, I know it's always a tough decision as a business owner, but you, when you're willing to do it, it it seems like you have an openness and you've just, you've, you've allowed the team to do their thing. Bob That's literally true. told us it's my business, but I want you guys to work with my team. I don't want, I don't want to get in the way. I want them to make decisions. I want to empower them. And that's hard for a lot of business owners to do. And it's not the same as take my hands off. It's their problem. Like I, I could hear in your voice, if you don't mind me sharing this, I can hear yeah, in your voice no, absolutely. that it's like, you're, you're, you're letting go, you're letting go. You're taking the, letting go of the bike and letting them knowing they're going to make mistakes, but it takes a lot to uh, invest that kind of trust in your people. And that, uh, that's a common trait that, We've all seen with business owners whose businesses just skyrocket and it seemed it gets easier because the more your people really perform and they do well, the more you're like, okay, go ahead and do it. And then the challenge becomes recognizing when you should step back in and provide that support. But I think that's a, a lot easier than trying to let go. I really just support and are the, the visionary for right now. And we're at a level where 
our visions are at where they're at. So until we kind of reach that that level, uh, we'll just work at that goal. And when we get there, we'll start, we'll raise the raise it up. So uh, for everybody out there, it, it gets a lot, of, it gets actually fun. Like I, it, that's what, po that would, is what came to mind. I think you said your son uh, finding it fun once you get to that level. And he's absolutely right. Cause I was getting burnt out at the other level of working in the business, I guess, as you guys call it. Now I'm working on the business and, and uh, I've been in businesses and I'll stop after this. I've been in business for 20 years. My biggest mistake was I strangled the business. I got to a certain level, life was good. I didn't want to lose my lifestyle, blah, blah, blah. And instead of letting it grow, I, I strangled it. And now, you know, it took a long time. It's very hard, but like you said, but now it's, uh, you have to have the confidence, but uh, I got to the point a little while ago to let it go and the changes are amazing. So anyways, uh, thank you once again, everybody. I've taken enough time. <laughs> we appreciate you, Bob. Glad you're here. Asha. Um, that gives me hope, Bob, because Matt and I were just talking about that and it's it is frustrating. Um, one of the things I would love your guys's, you know, feedback or guidance on is Matt and I were just talking about this actually today. Um, I feel like Matt has been playing um uh what was the word? I can't think of it where you're like having to jump in and like, um, uh, you know, take out all the fires, like setting out fires because of what's going mm -hmm. on within like the company and clients. Um, in the last month, it just feels like he's having to do a lot of da the damage control. There we go. Um, and it's kind of frustrating because the one thing Matt has done really well is, you know, he's an entrepreneur. He thinks, as an entrepreneur. So when he comes in and he's giving development um, tips or recommendations, or if he's coming in and giving marketing recommendations, he's thinking as an entrepreneur for our client. The problem that we are having is how do you replicate that? Like, how do you put processes in place for individuals to have that? Because the thing that we keep running into is the team members are great and they're told how to do their job they just do it head down. And they'll they'll do it. But we need people also to be thinking outside that box and kind of creating the innovative thought process for our clients instead of waiting for something to happen. And then Matt has to step in again and do this. And so it was a conversation of, you know, are we going to stay in business forever? And we're going to go through that where it feels like he's always having to be roped back in. He loves it. He does enjoy it, but that's not the ideal situation. And I, we both want to get to the point where we're not having our clients feeling frustration for them to have those innovative ideas coming from our team. So yeah, how, how do you navigate that? How do you put that in process? Like you can't just put it in a bottle and then like, all right, there you go. Team <laughs> member, drink that. Now you're just going to be like magic, like how everything is. Right. Like how do we do this? So I'll I'll say this, and some of this is I know from is is on the hiring side, and it's part culture. So I'll I'll give my comment, and then I know Kirk will weigh in on the just the hiring and culture side. Every organization I've ever worked in, uh, when I wasn't running my own business, I I was an entrepreneur. So you have the entrepreneur who takes huge financial risk to build a business and create financial freedom. Then you have the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur. They want to function like an entrepreneur in that they get to be creative and innovative and build and create, but they don't want the responsibility of owning the thing and being the, you know, having the buck stop with them um, completely. So right. where I've been attracted to organizations where I came in and I built and I acted like an entrepreneur building teams and building process, creating products um, is where they developed a culture to attract people like me, where it was okay for me to come in and have innovative ideas come in and look and and speak to things and do differently because a lot of organizations not saying that you guys are like this because i know you're not but a lot of organizations they kind of slap you on the wrist if you start coming up with ideas that contradict the status quo whereas other organizations say here's how we do it we want to do it better so we're looking for great talent to bring ideas and then you create a process to facilitate that and you just create some guardrails so people don't just go off and and do whatever they want so that's one aspect of it. And I'll let Kirk speak to the other side of it. Yeah, I think um, just to kind of 
to springboard off of what AJ said, it's really thinking big picture. And this is this is where you get into that fortification stage of the business. And you're starting to, instead of teaching process, you're now transitioning into teaching strategy. So I'll give you an example. Um, again, going years back, coming into a, a formal corporate structure, I had zero idea um, that HR people didn't know how to think strategically. It was very tactical. What's the problem? Put a policy on it, roll out said policy, make sure there's compliance, get a signature, you're done. The problem with that is that they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. So in the example that you give, Matt's an incredible executioner of process. He knows why he's doing what he's doing when he's doing it. So he has that thought inside. And this is where a lot of great strategy lives and dies inside the owner's head. And so when you have these scenarios, I would encourage you just to take the next step of creating either a, a Loom video or a Zoom video and just going through the decision tree of how you arrived at the solution for that client and then reverse that. So this was the, the question originally posed by the team member from the client. Here was the solution. Now I'm gonna to put together a three to five minute video of what my thought process was, why I did what I did, how I did it, and when I'm going to do it. And so you can start to teach people how to think through the, the, the question, but also think through the solution. I don't want people um, coming up with solutions if they don't know why. So we start with the why behind where we're going, and then we teach people how to do it. So think of that um, in, in kind of three cycles. It's, it's why, when, and then how. Why am I doing the thing that I'm doing? When do I do that? And then how do I do it? Those execution steps. Okay. I'm I'm going to be putting post-its all over my, my monitor. And I'm going to be <laughs> making sure I, I do that process when I'm creating looms or when Matt's creating looms. Because that is, that is a big thing that we're really working on right now. It's like we have, he's done a great job putting processes in place for development side. We're doing that for marketing. It's just that constant question, like how do we how do we keep innovating for our clients? So it's not like the fire is like taking down the house and we have to do something to like fix it again. Like we want to be always innovating for them on a consistent basis so they don't have to ask for it. Yeah. I mean, this goes back to where we started this whole conversation on the owner's bottleneck. If all of the information, all of the solutions, all of the problems have to filter through that tiny little hole we call the owner's brain, then you're only going to be able to scale as much as the capacity of that owner, of that leader is. Yeah. When, we, when we're able to duplicate our abilities, our efforts, our knowledge into another generation, when we look at generational organizations, we look at the, the different layers of the organizational chart, and then we look to see where the lines of communication within that organization. And then we can identify where those communication breaks are. Once we identify the clear lines of communication, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of times that an owner in those scenarios doesn't necessarily need to know because they've equipped a sound group of leaders to take on those questions and create the solutions and then just report up to the owner management team of the solutions that were born out of those uh, challenges. And you're not, you're no longer the one that's having to come up with the solutions. You're the one that's approving solutions. Okay. I will be working on that then. Thank you. Yep. That was an awesome question. Uh, I wanted to speak to uh, Logan's question. Uh, and add another aspect to it and then how I view data. Um, so the question was, should you use data 
should you use the data you have, even if you know it's not 100% accurate? So when I look at data, all data is good data because data tells you the questions to ask about the data. So when I look at a lack of data, that is data telling me where are the missing pieces. And so I don't know the scenario that you're asking with the scenario of this or the context of the question, but if I'm lacking data, say in marketing, which is most clients, they're not properly tracking. There's very little um, historical data on conversions, um, or even if there is data, it's it's not it's not accurate and it's just poor. So that tells me I need to go find a better and uh, relevant data source. So if I'm making in all true partners, we're we're making decisions that for things that and this will always be the case that we don't have historical data for. So we go to other industries. We go to uh, other data sources. There are so many data sources out there where you can find the information, but whatever data you have, you want to start there. And you and the question is, how do you utilize the data? You won't utilize it to make your decision. You'll utilize it to guide you in finding the data that you're lacking. So you think so you can then make the decision. And when you start thinking of your data like that, you'll never feel like you're lacking data. You either have the data or you have clues telling you what data you need to go find. And this is, you know, a side note. This is why I tell every business owner, never, 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 never just study your industry. You do study the bigger, uh, the broader business functions and principles. Every business does marketing, every business does sales, every business does finance, accounting, all those things. Study those and look at how other industries, other businesses do it. If you're in construction, that's very similar to, uh, let's say, a company that does manufacturing because you have short-term projects that keep the lights on. You have big long-term projects that are super profitable but take a long time to complete. So you, how do they manage the sales cycle and the revenue of their smaller turnaround, shorter turnaround projects versus their larger, more profitable projects that are actually higher risk because you took a 50% deposit and you get halfway through the project and the client decides they want a discount or the cost of materials increases. So one of the things that in that regard that we've seen with clients, just as an example of looking at other industries is we had a client that was uh, their costs were rising. So every time material costs rose, which has nothing to do with them, right now there's a uh, there was a port strike. That immediately causes increase in materials because ships had to that would typically land at ports on the East Coast had to circle all the way around to the West Coast. The cost for everything they're shipping just went up. So what happens is companies that are experienced in their contract have an escalation clause. And that means that if the cost of materials goes up, it goes up for the client. So you could take that principle and apply it to your business, regardless of what business you're in. So you start looking at business principle, and this is where you become a student, not of your industry or your specific business. You become a student of business. And this is how people, like if you look at the Mark Cuban, Jeff Bezos, all of these big names in business, they study business, not just their industry. And that's how they end up typically investing in a lot of different verticals uh, and you just make your your knowledge, you broaden your horizons. That's what we at All Two Partners do. We study business. I study marketing and sales across all kinds of industries. So I can see what are the commonalities, how sales is done. And ultimately, everything you're going to find ultimately comes down to people. So we appreciate you guys. Appreciate you being here. Make sure you join us next week. If you signed up, if you're on this call, that means that you got the email. So you're on that list. Uh, it's the same link every week. So we'll send out the, the reminder email and we'll see you guys on the next one. Have a good night, everyone.